Lesson 67, the end of the kingdom of Israel, uh, 2 Kings chapter 14. So this actually covers three different chapters. 2 Kings chapter 14 is where we'll begin. Lesson 67, the end of the kingdom of Israel. Um, a few things we're going to very quickly cover here in one day. The last seven kings of Israel. Um, there uh, is a period of about uh, 80 years. Um, it's a time of much trouble, much evil. There are some few bright spots that we'll see. Um, but as we talked about, the cup of iniquity of Israel, it's slowly been filling up. Now it's getting very close to the top. And when that cup of iniquity is full, then the Lord will come and judge Israel. And we'll see what their punishment here is today. So uh, the kingdom of Israel started out with a man named Jeroboam. And we start out today with a man named Jeroboam the second is what he's referred to. Uh, verse 23 of 2 Kings chapter 14. So if you're in 2 Kings chapter 14, then you want to turn there to uh, verse 23. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria and reigned 40 and 1 years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering in of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of the servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of Gath-Hether. For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, and that it was very bitter, for there was not any shut up, nor any left, nor any helper for Israel. And the Lord said, not that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, but he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam and all that he did in his might, how he warred and how he recovered Damascus and Hamath, which belonged to Judah for Israel, are, not, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And Jeroboam slept with his fathers, even the kings of Israel, and Zechariah his son reigned in his stead. So real quickly here, Jeroboam II, he reigns 41 years. Okay? Uh, but he worshipped the golden calves. Those golden calves that Jeroboam I put up, he worshipped them. Now this Jeroboam is the third generation from Jehu. So he is still obeying that law, however, the rule of the Lord, not to worship Baal. He is not bringing back Baal worship here to the people of Israel. Okay? Now, outwardly, 41 years is a long time. That's because his kingdom was very prosperous. Jeroboam warred, and he won many victories. Okay? He restored, he recaptured many of the territories that had been lost by previous kings. Okay? So now, it's kind of like they're back at the time when they were one of their greatest nations. Okay? But, uh, Jeroboam II was still an ungodly king. He still led the people in the worship of idols. Uh, but the Lord did use him to restore the lands. But now let's follow his son, Zechariah, which would be the fourth generation from Jehu. God is maintaining that promise. He's going to give Jehu four generations on the throne of Israel because he wiped out the house of Ahab and because they are not bringing back Baal worship. So let's see what happens with Zechariah. You have to skip to verse 8 of chapter 15. So look at 2 Kings chapter 15. Skip to verse 8 because the previous verses are about what's going on in Judah. We want to focus on Israel. Verse 8. In the thirty and eighth year of Azariah king of Judah did Zechariah the son of Jeroboam reign over Israel in Samaria six months. Whew, short reign. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord as his fathers had done. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat who made Israel to sin. And Shalem, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him and smote him before the people and slew him and reigned in his stead. And the rest of the acts of Zechariah, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. This was the word of the Lord that he spake unto Jehu, saying, Thy sons shall so sit on the throne of Israel unto the fourth generation. And so it came to pass. So there we have Zechariah. He only reigns for six months and then he's murdered. He's another wicked king. Uh, and he's murdered by this man named Shalem. We really don't know anything about him. He's obviously not in the family line. It doesn't matter in Israel. Christ is not coming from this line. Any man can take over the throne. So verse 13 tells us a little bit about Shalem. 
Shalem, the son of Jabesh, began to reign in the nine and thirtieth year of Uzziah, king of Judah, and he reigned a full month in Samaria. For Mahanaim, the son of Gadai, went up from Tizra and came to Samaria and smote Shalem, the son of Jabesh, in Samaria and slew him and reigned in his stead. And the acts of Shalem and his conspiracy, which he made, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. So Shalem only reigns for a month. He, too, uh, was wicked. Now you can imagine, too, if our, well, no, I take that back. In the United States, we're pretty orderly. Even when we've seen in the past, like this year we've seen in history, when President Kennedy was killed, there is a direct order of what will happen next. So the vice president gets sworn in. He becomes the next president immediately. We have an order. But maybe if we went to, say, an African nation, where there's different power struggles, and one man is in control, but when that man is murdered, now you might have two or three groups pop up that they all want to be the king and the ruler. And I'm sure that's what was going on here in Israel, too. Now they just had two kings killed progressively like that. Uh, Shalem's only on the throne for a month. You can imagine the lawlessness. Everybody's, we want our family on the throne. No, we want to be on the throne. Well, in this case, Menahem, who's the one who killed Shalem, he came from the north, and now we read here that he retaliated, which was sin. God says, I will avenge people. It's not your job to go get revenge, but that's what this Menahem does. He assassinates Shalem in the, past, in the palace. And then Menahem becomes the king. Now, there's probably other groups that are trying to become king, but he becomes the king. And let's look at the heinous sins that he introduces to Israel here. That cup of iniquity is going to get really full here. Verse 16, Then Menahem smote Tipsah, this is verse 16, sorry, of chapter 15, Then Menahem smote Tipsah, and all that were therein, and the coasts thereof from Tirzah, because they opened not to him, therefore he smote them, and all the women therein that were with child he ripped up. In the nine and thirtieth year of Azariah king of Judah began Menahem, the son of Gadai, to reign over Israel, and reigned ten years in Samaria. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and departed not all the days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. And Pul, the king of Assyria, came against the land, and Menahem gave Pul a thousand talents of silver, that his hand might be with him, and confirm the kingdom in his hand. And Menahem exacted the money of Israel, even all the mighty men of wealth, of each man fifty shekels of silver, to give to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and stayed not there in the land. And the rest of the acts of Menahem, and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Menahem slept with his fathers, and Pekahiah his son reigned in his stead. So this Menahem, uh, he arises to the throne, and he lasts here for a while. Uh, and Assyria comes and attacks from the north, and the only thing he can think is, boys, I want to keep this king happy. I don't want to lose my kingship, so I'll just, we'll become their servants. We'll give in. We'll surrender. And every man in Israel will have to pay him 50 shekels of silver. And we'll send that wolf king, the king of Assyria. He could go and he could kill everybody and maybe not get all the stuff, but he would rather have these people be his servants. So he accepts it. He takes all the money. He goes back to the north. Now Israel are slaves to Assyria. They must continue to pay the taxes or they're going to be punished or wiped out. Okay? And Menahem then uh, is wicked because what does he do? Well, he goes to a city in the north, which Israel had captured, and he becomes angry when they did not welcome him because they were angry with him because he had murdered some of their family. So they're angry with him. So what does he do? He goes through and he finds all the pregnant women and he kills them all and their babies. He destroys them. So not, now, not only has he wiped out one generation, but he's wiped out a whole other generation of children. He's a thoroughly evil man. He becomes the slave to Assyria, as well as all of Israel. And he does last here because he dies in old age. Is what takes him away from the kingdom. And then his son, Pekahiah. So let's see what happens to Pekahiah here, verse 23. In the fiftieth year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekahiah, the son of Menahem, began to reign over Israel and Samaria, and he reigned two years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. But Pekah, the son of Remaliah, a captain of his, conspired against him and smote him in Samaria, in the palace of the king's house, with Argob and Ariah, and with him fifty men of the Gileadites. And he killed him, 
and reigned in his room. And the rest of the acts of Pekahiah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. So he's only there for two years. And then his captain, one of the captains, this Pekah comes in with 50 of the men along with his bodyguards and they kill him. They put him to death. So what's going to happen? Well, Pekah is going to make himself king. Verse 27 through 31. In the two and fiftieth year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekah, the son of Remaliah, began to reign over Israel and Samaria and reigned twenty years. So that's a long time, twenty years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, came Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, and took Ijon and abel beth and Janoe. Ah and Kedish, and Hazor, and Gilead, and Gali, and all the land of Naphtali, and he carried them captive to Assyria. So part of the land begins to be taken away in the people. And Hosea, the son of Eli, made a conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Rimli, and smote him, and slew him, and reigned in his stead. In the twentieth year of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, and the rest of the acts of Pekah, and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. So, Pekah, uh, he's there for 20 years, a long time, but he does only that which is evil, and slowly Assyria is taking away the land and the people. Okay, God is slowly taking them away, beginning to show them what their punishment will be. That cup of iniquity is almost full. They should ask God for forgiveness. They should say, Lord, we ask for forgiveness. But that's not what is going on here. So, the Lord sends Isaiah another man to come, and he murders Pekah, puts him to death. Okay. So let's see what, uh, what happens. Verse 32, in the second, oh no, sorry, we've got to skip to chapter 17 to get out of Judah. Now we go to uh, chapter 17, verse 1. Okay. chapter 17, verse 1, okay, and see about Hoshio, the last king of the kings of Israel, 
Okay? So follow along here, chapter 17, verse 1. Uh, in the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, began Hoshea, the son of Elah, to reign in Samaria over Israel nine years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as the kings of Israel that were before him. Against him came Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, and Hoshea became his servant and gave him presents. And the king of Assyria found conspiracy in Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to, to So, king of Egypt. And brought no present to the king of Assyria, as he had done the year by year. Therefore the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria came up throughout all the land, and went up to Samaria, and besieged it three years. In the ninth year of the king of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria, and carried Israel away into Assyria, and placed them in Hala and in Habor, by the river Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. So, Pekah too dies because another man, Hoshea, kills him. Uh, Hoshea does evil, not as bad, um, but he doesn't go to the Lord. He doesn't say, Lord, look at the cup of iniquity is almost full. Come and restore thyself to us. He doesn't ask God, God, forgive us. Lead us in your worship. No, he didn't. And Hoshea at first pays some tribute, as he's supposed to do, because the kings of Israel have to keep paying that king of Assyria taxes. And when he refuses, when he stops, that's it. The king of Assyria comes in, he takes all of the people of Israel captive, and he spreads them. Because remember, the Assyria was the world's uh, largest nation at this time. Next it will be Babylon, and after that it will be the Greeks, and then after that it will be the Romans. But for a world empire, Assyria was large. So what do you do with all these captives? Well, you don't want them to band back together. So you put maybe a few thousand in this country, and then you send another thousand over here. And you send another thousand over here, and another thousand over here, and another thousand over here, and another thousand over here, until pretty soon they're all spread apart. They don't know where each other is. Probably many families are broken up that way, and they can't come back together. Now, meanwhile, you have this land of Israel that's going to be empty. Okay? So, King Hoshea, uh, oh, I forgot that. King Hoshea, he's taken captive too, and he's uh, uh, put into prison. Now, what about the rest of the land? What are you going to do with that? Well, that's if you skip to verses 24. So skip to verse 24 of chapter 17. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Cuthath and from Ava and from Hamath and from Sepharvaim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, Carry thither one of the priests who be brought from thence, and let them go and dwell there, and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. Then one of the priests, whom they had carried away from Samaria, came and dwelt in Bethel, and taught them how they should fear the Lord. Howbeit every nation made gods of their own, and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had, every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. So, what does the king of Assyria do? He doesn't want to leave Israel empty because he's afraid maybe the people of Judah will move north. Or maybe some of those Israelites will escape and they'll reassert themselves. So he takes other nations that he's captured. He takes some of them, and he puts a thousand from this country in here, and another thousand maybe from another country in here. And he puts them all into the land. Okay? Now, obviously, that's not pleasing to the Lord. The Lord wants his people there. The land of Canaan is a land for God's people. So what does he do to these heathen people? The Lord sends, sends lions among them to make them fear them. Okay? So the people of the land become fearful. Well, the king of Assyria says, well, this isn't good. Now no one wants to move here. They're all afraid. I know. I'll find a priest, a priest of this old nation, and put him there. <coughs> and so that's what he does. A priest is put there, okay? but you can't have a priest of God to try to convince an ungodly nation. No. This priest, all he's known is golden calves, false worship of God. And so all the heathen people do here is they begin to, again, worship another idol, another idol god. These will be eventually become the Samaritans, this group of people. There will be some Jews eventually further in the north in Galilee, where Jesus 
will spend Nazareth up there on the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus will spend most of his early life. You'll have the Jews who live down near Jerusalem, but in the middle here, you have these heathen nations that are brought in who are Gentiles. They are not Jews, as the people of Israel were. They are Gentiles, not from the line of Abraham. And they are brought in here, and these will be the future Samaritans that Jesus is going to work with. These will be people like you and me. And they're worshiping in the wrong, false way, but the Lord will eventually use Jesus and other, others to call these Samaritans, these Gentiles, out of their foolish worship eventually and into God's uh, marvelous light. So God uh, sent Israel uh, to their destruction because of their refusal to worship God. God brought them out of Egypt, and they never were happy. Okay? So what are some things I think I put on there? What were five things that they did? Well, we can say one thing they did wrong is they feared other gods. They went to Baal, Ashtaroth, and many other gods they worshipped. That's one sin. Two, they worshipped God, some of them, but they worshipped him through idols, golden calves. So maybe they didn't bow down to Baal, but they did bow down to God, but through idol worship, which God hates. So that's another thing. Some of them flat out didn't believe in the Lord. There's a Lord? Someone who made heaven and earth? Bah, humbug. I don't believe it. They did not believe in the Lord, and so the Lord destroyed them. There were others who copied the idols and the images of the nations around them. We'll even see that, how the people of Judah begin to do that in our next lesson. But they copied the idols of nations around them, and they thought, okay, so they said, well, I'm not going to worship Baal, but I'm also not going to worship God through those golden calves. I don't like golden calves. I like another set of idols. So they made their own idols. Maybe they fashioned them an idol after uh, a man or a woman. Maybe the idol was fashioned after a, a building, or maybe it was fashioned in as a as a as a um, a grain stock, because they worship grain. But we don't know what it is, so they worshipped other idols. And finally, sinfully and sadly, some of them even we read sacrificed their own children. They took their own children and put them onto the altar because that is what will make the gods happy. Then they will be happy. Well, there is no gods, first of all. There's only one God, and it's the true God, and he does not want the children of parents to be sacrificed. So because of these sins, God took Israel, he destroyed them, he put them away. Uh, and we read in Hoshea, uh, or Hosea, the, the prophet. He was kind of the last prophet at this time. God destroyed the wicked who were in Israel. Others have been called out of Israel to go to Judah. So, we might ask yourselves, and I put that question, how are the ten tribes still alive today? Well, we see the wickedness and the sinfulness of the world. Look at those five things. They fear other gods. They make money their god. They make their work their God. Fame, maybe, and power is their God. They want to be the most powerful person in the world. They make the wrong things into gods. There are some who worship idols. We could go off into other nations and see those who go into their Buddhist temples and bow down before the great Buddha. There are many who are stubborn and just won't believe in a God. God? Look at all this creation around us. How would God allow these bad things to happen? How would God allow death? There could not be a God. It's all just by chance. And then there's those who say they worship God, but worship Him in an improper and un... We think of maybe the Roman Catholics. They believe in a God, but we're going to do it through the saints, through Mary, through all these... Through all these practices and these different rituals that we have to go through. That's like worshiping through the golden calves. And then there's some who even sacrifice their children. They give up their families and their children into foolishness. And God does not bless them. 
So the ten tribes are still alive in the time even which we live. The sins that we see in the world around us, we can see that's still uh, happening here too.